What would happen if you took a car that is on the stones at your house, put in a brand new engine, new tires, what would happen to that car? And that's what we want to see today. It is interesting, again, that in this topic, we are actually looking at a very hot topic today. You know, from the time of opening of parliament, when uh, our colleagues were campaigning from all different political parties, agriculture was a very hot topic. So it's very befitting that today we do justice to it. And on my panel, I'm going to give each member three minutes uh, to touch um, on the subject as uh, time will permit. Thereafter, I will obviously open uh, the questions to the audience so that the audience can do justice. Then I will come back uh, to the team, first of all, for them to handle the questions, but then go on with follow-up questions so that we are able to go somewhere. And obviously, most of us will leave with something that is going to build our understanding. Or if we are in the business of agriculture, just know what we need to do. To kick off, I will start with the regulator of ICT pertaining to agriculture. Thank you so much, Mr. Chisala, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, as a regulator, I'm sure everybody knows that uh, ZIGTA's basic role is to regulate the ICT sector. In so doing, we look at issues of uh, mobile services, internet services, whether the playing ground is level, and uh, the spread of these services throughout the country. One of the most important roles of ZIGTA is to license all these services. And in so doing, we ensure that these services are spread out to everybody in the country. We ourselves are not a service provider, but we provide an enabling environment for providers to give you these services. So I will talk about some of the most prominent services which we all use in this room, I believe. And uh, I'll start with the mobile services. So mobile services are composed of SMS and the voice services on the phone that you use to call. This is the most uh, popular, popularly used ICT in the country. And uh, popular, by popular I mean we have at least 71% penetration throughout the country for mobile services. And this was as at September 2016. This 71% translates to 11.5 million subscriptions throughout. But actually we have stats that young people are the biggest users of ICTs at the moment. And putting uh, infrastructure and ICTs in schools will be a, a good way of investing in future technologies and ICTs. So this project has been widespread throughout the whole of Zambia, even in places as remote as uh, the furthest places in central province and I was just there inspecting on the usage uh, about three months ago. This, this project has been received very well. Another, another project is uh, uh, Girls in ICTs. Basically, CITA supports girls' usage in ICTs here with a lot of women. And there's also, uh, we've also noticed that uh, from funding stats that women are quite a big population of the farmers, so, which is a good thing. And also we have another project for ICT incubation which, which encourages innovation in ICTs. So apart from this, I will look at, uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell you of Zikta's interest in emerging technologies. Uh, due to time, I will cut to one emerging technology which is, which is of great interest to agriculture and this is digital financial services. This is basically a mobile money service uh, which is used by farmers in the most remote areas. It's easier for a farmer today to actually appreciate the application of technology in agriculture. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. As uh, the saying goes, uh, knowledge is uh, power. So you find uh, now I've got a new modern farmer who would like uh, information, uh, to get information as quickly as possible because also prices seem to be able to change also in, in a very quick uh, uh, time. So for him, as a modern farmer, he has now got access to information where he can uh, be able to, to, to make a decision about whether he should sell something or maybe wait. 
Then in terms of uh, uh, ICTs, there are a lot of developments that are going on apart from the ones that uh, they have mentioned. For example, some typical applications that are there, say for our friends in the southern province, you can find you, have, you can have a sensor which you put on your animal, which can tell you that now the, the animal, for example, is ready to be mounted. So for those who want to have a lot of animals, but have the best, they know that the best time to get the animal to be fertilized. Then in terms of irrigation, there are also these new ICTs which are coming in. Uh, for example, you can have a, some drip irrigation system, and then you've got the sensors in there which will be able to measure, for example, that there is enough water now, and then it will stop uh, the water being uh, pro provided. Then uh, uh, the ICTs which are also now being provided now in my environment, in the teaching environment, is that we have got uh, uh, computers. Now, the way we are trying to get our agriculture, for example, agriculture engineers, is to, to get them updated with softwares for design. So instead of uh, our children playing around with uh, games, they have got now tools where they can build environments or design machines which we can uh, be able to to build. So agriculture is no longer what it was in the 60s. It has now moved to where we now use, uh, we have to use computers. And uh, the only weakness that we are having in uh, agriculture right now is we don't have the, the hype for agriculture. For example, in agriculture engineering, I normally graduate uh, 10 students uh, every year in agriculture engineering. But then you find the direction which as a country we're supposed to go, we're supposed to go in the field of agriculture. So if I am able to graduate 50 students every year, then we say we're making a impact. So if it's just 10, but, uh, for me to have 50, it will take five years. And I don't think we are in, we, we, are, we, we need to wait uh, that long. So one of the critical things that we need to deal with in agriculture is manpower. If you don't have the trained manpower, we'll just be wandering around, having discussions like this. Next year we'll come and have a similar discussion and we won't be able to move. But uh, one of the directions we have, we have realized that that's a problem, so we have got a master's uh, program that we have introduced. So this year I'm graduating three master's students in agriculture engineering, and those will be able to, to help me if I want get people to start training at that uh, high level. So as long as we keep uh, such an important topic, we just keep it uh, uh, casually, we we'll never get anywhere. So for us to reach that level, we need to reach a stage where uh, if it's agriculture engineering or agriculture, you have maybe 200 or 300 uh, people with PhD, then that would mean you're going to have maybe a thousand masters and then undergraduates at least 5,000. That's when you're going to see the difference. If you look at countries like, for example, Rwanda or Burundi, they are doing far much more agriculture than we are doing. Why? Because they have raised the level of education. And the other thing that I want also to be able to tell to uh, our new generation is that agriculture is not dead. People would rather go out to other jobs, but it's a, it's a very cool uh, job. So once we make it that, then we get the best minds in there, then we can make uh, Zambia the breadbasket of Africa, rather than being a, a supermarket for South Africa. First of all, I've forgotten the rules of our auditorium. Please, let's put our phones on, on silent. This aspect of talking of technology in agriculture, real, and can it transform uh, you know, the performance of agriculture, which will also touch on economic performance. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and good afternoon all. Thanks, Dr. Chileshe. Uh, exactly what you said is um, what is supposed to happen in the country, but the the population that is talking about of graduates in agriculture is actually alarming. But there's a bridge there, as moderators said, and we've built one, quite a, one bridge. I'm not actually in agriculture, but I found myself in agriculture because of technology. 
So what we've done is we have partners. We've partnered with Ministry of Agriculture. We've partnered with Zamtel. Uh, we've partnered with NASA, and we've partnered with uh, Maryland University. We've come up with our own application, and we've actually donated 1,000 of these tablets to Ministry of Agriculture for the Extension Services workers. And what they do is they collect biodata of the farmer, and the biodata includes the name, the age, the sex, the phone number. We also collect the geolocation of the farm. And in that, after we collect the geolocation, we've mapped the entire Zambia using a 1970 or 74 FAO map, soil map. So we're able to know which type of soil, meaning that even the blanket fist that government is giving is actually a waste. Because they'll give the same seed, they'll give the same fertilizer, whether in Western Province, in Eastern, in Northern, in Wakula. Why give a person in Western Province maize? They're good for rice. So we've come up with a software and a solution for that, where we've incorporated uh, meteorological department's data for average precipitation per year. So we're able to advise the farmer through the extension services the planting season, the start of season. Like last year, start of season was starting from 17th of December. And I always say this as a joke. On 18th of October, Zambia went for prayers and we prayed for rain. Um, we have a bumper harvest from last year's and we, we've been able to tell from satellite and ground truth in using drones. But really what happened is government would delay it in taking the uh, input. That was the saving. Had they taken much earlier, would have had a disaster. Because when you give the incentive to the villager, they'll put it in the ground. They'll say the first rain, Bayama, Wambuya, whatever it is, told me the first rain I should plant, would have had a disaster. So in order to mitigate this, we've come up with a solution which we, we are digitizing all the farmers. Uh, Ministry of Agriculture tells us there's 4.8 million farmers in Zambia right now, from the most poorest to the corporate farmer or the commercial farmers. The, the pyramid in Zambia is that 88% of our farmers are actually peasant farmers. Only about 5 to 12% are commercial farmers. The pyramid is different in Zimbabwe. And depending on your policy, we are better off with the pyramid of 88 because you and I grow for, for consumption. The excess is what we sell. In Zimbabwe, it's different. They were, they were growing for GDP. Policy, politics, turn the things upside down. They don't know how to do small scale farming. That's why they have a disaster. And like I said, now the beneficiaries of our data includes government, insurance companies in full weather index. Right now, there's no insurance company that would want to go into agriculture insurance. Because they, they have the data, but they don't have the information. So the, the world has transformed, in my perspective, into Three, three, it has transformed three times. From commodity based to information, informa information age, we are now in knowledge management and borrowing what to say, exactly where we are, we are now managing information that we have. Then the other beneficiaries are financial institutions, because through that, because we know the geolocation and we're able to map the sizes of the farms, the person now is able to have access to finance. So financial institutions are part of the beneficiaries of this inform information. Then commodity exchanges. I'll give you Jobe Commodity Exchange. It's like Soweto Market, run by the municipality of Jobe. They have a turnover per day of, in terms of dollar, of more than three million dollars. Why can't we do that? We, I've gone to Soweto Market. I found the Chinese selling eggs, potatoes, eggs. Where are we? We can be empowered and do that. So commodity exchanges can be, can be set up as PPP. Also, it will guarantee quotas. Uh, Dr. Cheshire said Zambia is a supermarket of South Africa, and it's true, because we don't have a quota system. If ShopRite today said, I would want to have this quality of potatoes, and I want 100 tons of potatoes per week, we can't guarantee that, because we don't have a quota system. Just two and a half hours from here, we go to Kenya or Rwanda. They are perfect in terms of cooperatives, which they copied from us. 
So the Equity Bank is supporting the corporate. Thank you, Mr. Mbewe. <laughs> give, give someone. He's a very nasty moderator. Give someone from Chipata a microphone. He was singing the end of the whole day. I, uh, I can see that we've heard from one of the private sectors. What is it that you think is not happening or should happen coming from uh, an inventor like you? Thank you. Mr. Salem, thank you, Mr. Um, yes, my name is Lokonga. How many of you here use technology in agriculture? How many don't? Let me try that. How many don't use any technology? Check. Great, thank you. I'll start from that. Great. Um, one big thing that we've been addressing over the past few years is just the fact that there are so many silos. Um, even when someone gets trained, for them to understand the context of where they are working with them, it's so hard. One of the things that is a challenge is people are expecting geeks, developers, computer people to be developing the apps, the websites, and the platforms that would be beneficial for agriculture. They've been there. We keep waiting and waiting and waiting. We've been doing this for five years, and the biggest challenge we find is one, they understand what agriculture is, but he knows how to develop an app. What role can we play? By bringing the technology people, whether they're in university, closer to the farmers so that together we can actually create solutions that are relevant to Zambia. Now, some of you say Zambia is very big, eh? So the big challenge again is that you've got the haves and the have nots. 77% penetration rate, 21%, but you still have in the rural areas where people don't have network, okay? Now, the question is, if I develop a USSD application, a mobile application, will it be relevant to that peasant farmer who's growing something for his family of five, an extended family of 25? <laughs> or, as an entrepreneur, will I focus on the commercial farmers who will pay me good money if I develop an application which is relevant to their needs? Apart from that, can I develop a business model where a farmer will actually pay to access the information? Now, when I'm talking about paying here, touching on what he has said about uh, mobile services and uh, mobile money, are we able to actually get money from a farmer in the middle of nowhere to a guy sitting on a computer somewhere in this building who is running a business? Is that possible? Those are the real challenges. Now, this is an entrepreneurship conference. We always say at Bongo Hive, if there's a challenge, it means that there's a business opportunity. All right? Give us, you know, under your three minutes, just on how you are moving, what kind of initiatives have come up, and if you're doing anything with uh, the Department of Agriculture. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chisara. Uh, before I give my, my little knowledge on ICT in agriculture, uh, a question was asked by local guards to say how many people have used technology in, uh, in agriculture and I saw just a few hands go up and I was thinking to myself maybe we should qualify it a bit if I say how many people have seen any information to do with agriculture say on TV how many of us have how many have heard anything on agriculture on radio <laughs> thank you so, <laughs> so just uh, to give that broader picture, when we talk about technology, I think maybe some people might say, might, might think, you know, I need a smartphone or a computer or a tablet or some digital gadget of some sort, and then I throw it in a field, and I have ICT and agriculture. But actually, it's quite broader, and whether we know it or not, there are facilities, the IT facilities that are out there that we have probably interacted with already. We interact with them uh, at present. But um, with that said, um, 
I'm from uh, the computer science department at the University of Zambia, but I'm hoping I'm speaking uh, on behalf of other uh, ICT educators uh, in the country. So as a department at the university, what we do are mainly two things. We teach and we do research. Okay, so what we teach is, well, computer science, the different aspects of computer science. And I think what is important uh, from that area is what is it that we are transferring to the students? Uh, from Dr. Chileshe, and we've had a lot of solutions from Bogo Hive. One of the things that you have to understand in the space of ICT is that uh, the regulating of uh, financial aspect falls with Bank of Zambia and the regulation of the platform where these mobile uh, payments are made is regulated by Zikta. So we look at the pipes, we are the plumbers, and then we have Bank of Zambia who are the electricians to make sure that they light up your place. But what we've done uh, is that we've signed an MOU uh, with Bank of Zambia and we're having our first meeting tomorrow uh, looking at uh, digital financing. It is uh, one of the biggest emerging uh, issues in ICT and uh, we cannot stay behind. We are talking about the development of applications that in itself has become a danger uh, on mobile payments because some of these applications have got uh, the potential to evolve and actually take money from you and give it to the person who was developing. So there are a lot of challenges really that surround the, the ambience of uh, a digital financing. But what I would also want to do with you is people like you become cardinal because as Bongo Hav was saying, as an IT person, you cannot find a solution for a farmer. You need a farmer to tell you the problems that they have so that you can actually go on and draw up something that is workable. So we would want also, like I said to the other individual, contact our, we have what we call an incubation program, and that's what uh, Bongo Hive does as well. But we are a government agency. We've also got a young innovators program where we look at inventors that can come up with, and we do a lot of work with, uh, with Bongo Hive. So from that perspective, we can see on what kind of solutions we can have. The expiring of data, uh, as was put up, uh, I keep on telling people this is not an excuse. Uh, in the regulating space, we have a lot of players. The competition, CCPC, it's a uh, competition commission, uh, put up, your yeah, consumer competition, put up um, a ruling. Because as a regulator, we had actually told uh, the service providers that uh, this data did not need to expire. But the, the, the commission uh, gave a ruling, and it was a big page in the paper for the whole month, where they said that data was just like a product like milk, and it would expire. So the service providers draw their strength from that perspective. Again, I go back to you. When CCPC gave that ruling, where were you, all of you, to sit together and go and see CCPC and tell them, explain to us the gymnastics in this expire? You have to understand, though, that uh, the service providers pay for the numbers that you get, meaning MTN, Airtel, and Zamtel, they pay Zikta for the numbers that you use. So there is uh, an assumed contract. If you don't put in airtime in your phone for the whole three months, the service provider will chain you off their network because it's an expense that they can't stand. So from that perspective, you will see that for voice, they've given it 90 days still that if there's no activity on your phone, they would obviously chain you out. So it's a mechanism that they also have. As a regulator, really, we have the right to protect consumers, but we have also got the mandate to ensure that the investors keep on investing in this space. Remember with IT, they change every three months. And for these people, remember we just used to have voice. Remember the days that your mobile phone was just used for voice? But because these people keep on reinvesting, now we've got data. And again, do you know that with data now, voice will be useless because you can use your WhatsApp or Skype to actually make a call without paying for that. So you can see that there are a number of things that are coming up. No wonder such rulings are put, are put up in front. With technology, they can, they can fuel wheat. The algae that you're talking about would be something of the past. And moreover, there was also a test in China where this algae, with a certain um, chemical put in water, becomes turns into food that your fish, if you're doing fish farming, becomes an added advantage to the fish.
So what we need to do is to have uh, the stakeholder meeting with all of you so that we can have one voice. It becomes very difficult to say we can work in the same way by the access to people. But that's not the goal that is there. And also you guys have to be our voice.